Carl, and uh, my gratitude as well for the persons who were on the panel here, Tilan and Ricardo. Um, honored, and I would like to preface what I'm about to say or read with the caveat that it's a kind of perhaps unstable juggling act, balance, dance, I'm a bad dancer, between a creative performance and um, an academic reflection. Because the work of Alexis Pauline Gums, for those who may not be aware of her work, is deeply informed uh, by what we would recognize as high theory, Sylvia Winter, Hortense Spillers, things of that nature. But her design is to create ritual and ceremony in her writing. And so I would describe her work as oracular and um, something of an invitation. So I'm, despite my research interest and specializations, I've been pulled in this direction through a chance encounter and referrals from people. And I reached out to her, letting her know that I would be presenting on her work. Um, it is not my specialization, but it was something that I felt worthy of shining a light on. So I hope that there's something that can be taken. It's gonna be a different sort of presentation from the wonderful ones that I've heard thus far. And so it'll be a little bit of theoretical inflection, but also me just reading aloud sections at different times from her works to give you a sense of the writing itself. So there are various syntactic gestures she makes at decolonization. I think she performs decolonization uh, on the ground with various movements that I'll reference, but also in her writing practice. So with that being said, I will begin. This presentation is an experiment with what allows us to bring community into work. Specifically, this presentation is an experiment with what allows us to bring community into the work of Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, who declares herself to be a queer black feminist love evangelist and marine mammal apprentice, whose goal is to facilitate infinite unstoppable ancestral love in practice, end quote. By expounding on the creative interventions of Dr. Gums and the theoretical work of her mentors, mothers, my goal is to elaborate a practice of enunciation that explores the oracular nature of writing, which in turn contributes to a different humanness, to borrow the phrase from Sylvia Winter, which is grounded in relational praxis. That said, my first responsibility as a community accountable intellectual, that is the preferred term, by Dr. Gums is to name my subject position as did Thielen and the biohistorical space of enunciation to the best of my ability. This requisite accountability is a performative counterweight to prevailing assumptions of cognitive empire, which of course all of us have experienced this conference attempting to interrogate and from which in moments at least it's been able to epistemically de-link. I, following the me of accusation have been equipped with multiple hermeneutic keys over the last 39 years. In order of operation, the first would be the Euro-American Christian theology, theology of dispensationalism made famous by Cyrus Schofield and Dwight Moody. According to this industrial railroad inspired world history, my time is but one of several preordained periods leading to the triumphal return of a savior king whose judgment will ultimately destroy the world I inhabit and create a new earth. And for some of the research in that particular area, my colleague and friend, Alan Richard, uh, should be coming out with something uh, as a part of a collection on American evangelicalism and conspiracy and its relationship to these two figures, Schofield and Moody. After several years of intermittent and despair-filled bouts of anxiety, I was given a new key, grounded in what was described then as objective or scientific truth, that was rumored to successfully articulate the truth of Christian statements of faith. And this would be, uh, in other words, perhaps my entrance into what Thielen so wonderfully described as the Kantian island of pure reason. Some would describe this period as my initiation into white liberal Protestantism, whose influence on present structures of governance is not to be underestimated. But it was not until successive encounters with Marxist, feminist, queer, indigenous, liberation, black and queer theologies that I began to distance myself or so I thought from the thought patterns and practices of the liberal regime. And to be honest, I suppose it would be naive to assume or to suggest that I am past these forms altogether despite my efforts at escape. And this is of course what 
Emmanuel Levinas himself recommends, or at least it's what he talks about early in his uh, writings uh, during the rise of Hitler. It is tempting to falsely provide a reason as in a recognized and peer reviewed account for my investment of time and energy in the collaborative work of Dr. Gums and her ancestor peers, but I instead simply affirm the movement and invitation of her work, or perhaps more accurately, the me has affirmed and celebrated the invitation before I was aware of the ceremony. It is indeed ritual that provides a context for my analysis, and it is exhortation that demands my participation in this conference and in all conversations. With this in mind, I offer the following meditation from Dr. Gums herself and a brief word. This comes from her book, Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. And it is her critique of the scientific writing around marine mammals specifically, and her attempt to creatively offer as a gift, a form of writing that speaks to the relationship and lessons to be learned. One, listen. Once upon a time, there was a giant sea mammal who weighed up to 23 tons swimming in the Bering Sea. In 1741, a German naturalist discovered Hydrodamalus gigas swimming large and lux, at least three times bigger than the contemporary manatee. Within 27 years, the entire species was extinct, killed on thousands of European voyages for fur and seal skin. So she knows what we know. It is dangerous to be discovered. 27 years. Who else could only tolerate 27 years among Western humans? How do we mourn and survive the violence of being known? How does capitalism so quickly destroy what took billions of years to evolve? What can I do to honor you now that it is too late? I would honor you with the roughness of my skin, the thickness of my boundaries, the warmth of my own fat. I would honor you with my quiet and my breathing, my listening further and further out and in. I would honor you with the slowness of my movement, contemplative and graceful. I would try to be like you, even though they say it's out of fashion. I will remember you, not by the name written in the possessive of the one they say discovered you after generations of indigenous relationship. I will say once upon a time, there was a huge and quiet swimmer, a plant-based rough skin listener, a fat and graceful mammal. And then I will be quiet so I can hear you breathing. And then I will be breathing and you'll remind me, do not rush. And the time in me will hush. And then we will be listening for real. So that ends the meditation. Remember, Dr. Gums, works to remember, or her work is a practice of remembering and dreaming and writing, writing herself and her, quote, kindred beyond taxonomy, end quote, into the future, a task given her by a mentor mother, Octavia Butler. In my language, this praxis is a kind of witnessing. Now that's the language of my particular specialization. Specifically, it is bearing a witness that is unbearable, born by the practice and in the practice of witnessing the enlivening memories constitute an affective archive. Additionally, this ceremonial practice of witness bearing intervenes sociopolitically as evidenced by Gums's involvement in Ubuntu, a women of color survivor led coalition to end gendered violence and create sustaining and transformative love, end quote. And Southerners on New Ground, a social justice advocacy and capacity building organization focused on empowering persons and communities who have been persecuted because of race, sexual orientation, gender, expression, and ability. Finally, I want to suggest that witness is never simply born individually, but rather collectively and across between temporal zones. To make this clear, Dr. Gums challenges the clock time, as she says, of Euro-American industrial capitalism with the ritual time of ancestors, which is sometimes in her work named communion. Taken together, I contend that these modalities of witness are just some of the ways that she contributes to the end of Western cognitive empire and its enthronement of capital. Ancestral context. The work itself 
frequently acknowledges all my relations. She typically prefaces the book or work, whatever she has with that acknowledgement, both human and non-human. And it pays close attention to the bloodstream paths of a transatlantic voyage that is assembled under the term diaspora. That said, some of the more academically situated relations that I'm highlighting here are Hortense Spillers, Jackie Alexander, Audrey Lord, Octavia Butler, and Sylvia Winter. These community accountable intellectuals constitute an inner circle of sorts for Dr. Gums, as evidenced in several of her works. The first, M Archive, After the End of the World, is a detailed imagining of the imminent apocalypse through the lens of post-dated evidence. Within this text, Gums channels the work of M. Jackie Alexander, whose Pedagogies of Crossing details the ongoing violence of the transatlantic slave trade precisely because of, quote, the indivisibility of the water, wind, earth, and fire, end quote. As an elemental meditation on trauma, Pedagogies of Crossing and M. Archive both stress the carceral definitions of the human that have persisted up to the present, offering the reader the chance to be witnesses. In Gum's words, her text, and I quote, offers a possibility of being beyond the human and an invitation into the blackness of what we cannot know from here, end quote. In a similar vein, Gums's contribution to Octavia's Brew, which is a collection of works related or sort of written in homage to Octavia Butler. In this work and her contribution, she evinces a witness in reverse, a projected set of accounts addressed to us, the progenitors of the dystopian picture that serves as the setting for the text. This imaginal practice invites the reader participant into a relationship with the not yet in the hopes of gifting the future with further possibilities. In Spill, Scenes from a Black Feminist Fugitivity, she is inspired and informed by the work of Hortense Spillers, whose last name is creatively conjured and even contorted on the different pages of the book. Spill is a meditation on the afterlife of slavery, or more specifically, after the afterlife of slavery if we are to understand our present situation as the violent afterlife of colonization and slavery. Fugitivity names the performative response of witness in the midst of a narrative made and broken by, in her words, black women. In short, the text invites affect through a certain practice of bringing to mind another way of saying witness. In dub, finding ceremony, Dr. Gums explores the destabilization of origins in a practice of past life reckoning. This work draws heavily on the scholarly contributions of Sylvia Winter. And as an examination of epistemology, it foregrounds the limitations of taxonomy to open possibilities for new relationships to the earth. Early on, she quotes specifically from an interview of Winter conducted by Catherine McKittrick in which Winter confidently states that what the humanities have been relating to as the history of the human has all been insidious science fiction, a fiction about what science is written deep in our neurological responses, end quote. By offering a human that is not biocentrically imprisoned, we might say with Winter and Gums that homo narens in contrast to homo sapiens is what we are always practicing and becoming. Modalities of witness. The affective archive, affect, verbal definition one, to make a mental impression on from the 1630s, to attack circa 1600, to act upon or infect the early 15th century. The noun, mental state, late 14th century, noun use of affectus, which means to dispose or to be constituted or inclined, literally furnished, supplied or endowed, an archive, records or documents preserved as evidence, circa 1600, public records, written records, affective archive, a preserved practice, storytelling and other forms of making that affects as in contaminate and infect so as to constitute or incline. Dr. Gums embraces both the joy and urgency of co-creating an affective archive and testifies to this with both her creative, academic, ancestrally co-written text, and what she describes as her movement work. 
The latter includes the co-founding of the Mobile Homecoming, an archive of, in her words, Black queer brilliance. Whether adjacent to the academy, which is an institution that she describes unapologetically as an industrial capital complex, or in the throes of soil cultivation, Dr. Gums demands community accountability, narrative sharing, and beyond human embodiment, all of which emerge in the counter institutional practice of an affective or experiential archive. The following lines from Spill, scenes from a Black feminist fugitivity and dub finding ceremony, serve as testimonies that I selected to this creative endeavor. So I'm going to read from initially Spill and then move into Dub. Is she water wreck or witness? Is she push or hush or thud? When the universe is opened, will she last? She decided to paint her discontent all over the outside walls with leftover house paint and chicken feathers and grease. The body parts of other women hung like smokehouse family, a warning. What God would want to sacrifice like that? She had to leave. They will know us by the shadow we cast over sunrise, the horizon we can't ever fill. The men she knew might have wanted to go to medical school, but that was not an option. So they became freelance surgeons for cars. Whiteness leaves its residue. Chalk outlines precede police. We would like it if you wrote us poems. This is from Dub. We would like it if you wrote us long life sentences. We would like it if you broke sentences and gave us more life than you or we were told could be contained. We promise to think of you more often than you think of us. We promise to remember when you forget. They will unfound you and surround you unfind you and unwind you, travel to you, unravel through your own needle, gather the thread, collect your dead. They say God moved over the face of the deep, but in the deep there we already were, already pulsing, already pulled by moon, relevant to us whether or not it was lit by sun. They fear the depth of the ocean rightly. Perhaps it is best to say that Dr. Gums writes about being remembered and is thus able to remember and be contaminated by the making of others in unilluminated spaces wherein lives witness that is born through the ages across space and time. Two, the immemorial. Not only does Dr. Gums write herself and all her relations into the future, but she is moved to do so by what is behind and underneath all presents, even all past and futures. Her times are not linear, but move in several directions, all of which further relations that seem impossible. These alternative temporalities valence vision differently, since it is precisely what escapes prevalent conceptual vision that is borne by witnesses. The addresses that are issued through the bodies of work co-authored by Dr. Gums indicate that the erasure of people's beings, places, and practices of people beings who place make are at best temporary. The attempts to erase show up, for example, in uh, her example, bioluminescence. And I'm gonna read uh, a short bit from M Archive. They were the first ones who learned to light themselves and find each other. The critical black marine biologists, scientists of the dark matter under fathoms, suggest that there may be a causal relationship between the bioluminescence in the ocean and the bones of the millions of transatlantic dead. Oyeku Ope. They have been studying the relationship between blackness and light, which is not to say that before the face of God or the race of capital moved across the deep, there was no light within the deepest sea creature, but is instead a signal to remember the character of calcium, the meaning of the presence of magnesium, both of which catalyze bioluminescence." End quote. The darkness of light exposed in the immemorial recurrence of erasure, seismic displacements of bodies and the transmogrification of stories. Under erasure, but seeping through, 
contaminating the signals of illuminated discourse that presage the disaster. A memorial like a eulogy often tries to impose a non-catalytic calcification, but when water is added, and I'm returning here to uh, Dr. Gums's work in dub, she writes, save the top of your head for the water. Don't let the nonsense burn it out. Cleanse with salt and coolness. Thousands of years ago, it was a spout. Let that water move within you. Let it be you. Let your every cilia dance you into healing. Let the warm salt water brighten you. Dream until you birth yourself in water, singing with the bones of all your lost. Three, against genius. A genius forgets everything but themselves, and in remembering only themselves is dismembered forever. Perhaps Dr. Gums would agree with this statement. Kant would protest. Kant, who favors the inexplicable expression of emotion detached from a community of nurture and struggle, third critique here, somewhat ironically, despite claims of moral clarity at odds with responsibility for others, especially those he mentions in his anthropology. But a community of earthlings, cultivated earth seeds, whose supposed distance is easily traversed, not epistemologically, but relationally, a community, a communion across space and time, a community between spaces and times, and thus not reduced to space and time. This interstitial practice of witness refashions genius as the guardian spirits or deities, ancestors perhaps. These tutelary spirits resemble the earlier usages of the term genius, from the 14th century. What would it mean for the geniuses that are all our relations to guide, encourage, celebrate, instead of monomaniacally expressing, extracting, claiming, gesturing towards the spectacular? Within the work of Dr. Gums, this invocative incantation opens new relationships near and far, while acknowledging that those terms are less useful than they once were, if ever they were. Sometimes in your dreams, she writes, you paint us with pieces of books you have read that we didn't write. Somewhere you read that we didn't really write, but we did and we do. I mean, look, not just here in the book, but look, your face. There was a time when we thought no one would ever understand, even that, as we say, it presupposes time as you understand it. And that's not what we mean. What we mean is how could you? How could you understand imperatives outside of time? How could you live this daily way if you did? How could the waves we sent become words you could hold or could they? If they would be flutters in your heart, would you yet know them? Pulses in your thighs, would you still know what to do? And then you started dancing, all of you, any of you. And that's when we knew to keep sending the messages. That's when we knew that you knew. And I'm closing here, a less than final word. My attempt at something like a conclusion references Gum's article, Cole, Black Matter Oracle, which itself is an oracular reading of Audre Lorde's poem, Cole, which Gums describes as Lorde's response to the observation by many in the Black arts movement that Lorde and her lesbianism, feminism, and use of British spellings in her poems did not read properly as Black. I will follow one of her suggestions because she gives a set of instructions about how to compose a poem. That's what she often does in her writing. She invites you going in as reader to participate or to practice with her. The letter for this challenge is M, M, male, mask, modern, morbid, mm, melancholy, maladroit masculinity, mistakes, meekness, missing majesty, mask, manufacture, modern myopia, morbid maleficence, misguides, marginal melodies, making madness magnetic, my attempt here has been to explore the pressurized edges of language in Dr. Gums's work and in other works as well, inspired by an oracular register. If the work of a word is embedded in the relations with other beings, then the new quantum computers that experiment with non-binary applications merely mimic the digital refractions of black embodiment. An interstitial witness is a way of living between constraints, viable, permeable, and powerfully fluid. The emergence of counter institutions like those that Dr. Gums has helped to co-create serve as indicators of an epistemological imperative outside of chronological adornment. These indices are not simply cries, but commands, pushing against the forces of human exchange rates and academic industry as consistently as they press against the systematic lynching and diminution of black queer women. The instability of taxonomy show up in these fractalized witnesses that continue to contaminate 
the nooks and crannies of all established power. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joshua. That was uh, really fruitful. Um, We've we, got about five, we started more. about five minutes late, Carl. So maybe we should just we should give five minutes in to to Joshua or to respondents to Joshua. I was going to say, one quick question that can be answered quickly, and we can finish in five minutes. That'd be great. Right. Roger, you want to ask something? Because this is kind of up your alley here. Let me just leave it up to the, to, to the participants first. I, I know it takes people a minute to breathe and think. I want to just mention something, and I'll, I hope this might invite additional thoughts later on. But yesterday, Dr. Antonio, Edward Antonio and Dr. Tinker and uh, Dr. De La Torre were talking about this borderlands or in-between space and the title of the paper I just read was Interstitial Witness. And I know that there was a bit of tension yesterday, but I found it creative. And Dr. Antonio responded by saying that in-between space is not so much a destination, but a strategy. And I found that to be very helpful. Um, so I just wanted to lift that up. I think that was kind of part of what I was trying to do. Yeah. The interstitial is is a, is a general term for a lot of what's going on in these conversations. I mean, one thing we want to know is what we, we take the term decoloniality, we don't want to reify it. It's, it's uh, I, I was, Tink Tinker talked about the way we just love nouns in our language. And you can't, uh, even though the interstitial is technically, uh, grammatically a noun, uh, it's, it's, it can't be reified. It's always in the sense it's self-deconstructive. So, I... I think one of the things I wonder about is that you're pointing out that space, Joshua, um, that Miguel de la Torre was talking about with, with the Orishas in his office. Um, in the, and Edward Antonio was talking and Tink Tinker were talking um, about uh, the population of displacement that um, modernity and colonialism brings into existence. And I'm wondering how that, um, I'm, I'm hearing some resonance with the ways that you're using um, gums and winter and spillers I'm wondering how that, um, I don't know what the verb is to use, uh, uh, how that operates in relation to what Thielen was saying earlier about the giving, the, like about what land back means and, and, and the unsettledness that it means for the, un, for the settler. Um, I wonder what relation those, to, I, I don't know, comportments might have, or if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I was thinking about it as Thielen was talking, actually, this notion of opacity, right? We have this kind of sense of entitlement that we need to sort of understand what's it going to look like. We want to prepare ourselves so that we have a settler future. And I think, interestingly enough, you know, my work has been in Levinas, one of the early theorists of alterity and the absolute incomprehensible, you know, the other is not in these illuminated spaces of discourse that phenomenology seeks to open up. And so Levinas is over here as a Jew whose family was destroyed in, in the Holocaust and, you know, always is writing with that. And I think that uh, Fred Moten comes along later and writes about Levinas's anti-blackness. And I think that's an interesting, so uh, there's a kind of, there's a slippage and maybe that's kind of even to Carl's point as well, but this notion of opacity, I think, is really important, right? And in, instead of like when we make gestures and we try to take a, 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 a when we participate in the practices of, of land back, um, to not enter those efforts with the expectation of some kind of reciprocity, or I mean, I, I'm not sure what language would be used by people, but um, but that word opaque stood out to me when do you, you mean that in the Charles Long sense, because that's what Victor Taylor brought up the opacity. Okay, yes, this is Charles um, Long's uh, yeah. 
concept. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, exactly.